goals. And then we're going to be having a series of other webinars at later dates going more deeply into how the system can actually work and help you in each of the vertical industries. Because I know that a number of you are participating today are from different vertical industries, banking, retail, distribution, energy, etc. So today I'd like to introduce uh, Bryant Haynes, who will be leading the discussion. And Bryant leads the Cyber Intelligence Unit here at DataSkill Akumi. He brings over 20 years in defense intelligence, weapons development, counter weapons development. He also has worked with the US Pentagon and France Defense Agency and some of the largest banks in the world focused in the area of counter fraud. Bryant now leads the DataSkill Akumi Cyber Intelligence team. Joining Bryant is Luke Bayer, who is lead in our data science group, and he's a data science fo scientist focused in the cyber intelligence area. Luke was VP at a large bank in Canada and led in the database team. He also worked in one of the large big four accounting firms and led the quantitative and predictive modeling teams in the data analytics focused on cyber threats. Today we'll be covering at a high level um, all the different types of cyber attacks and threats and how it touches different industries, and then really showing the in-depth screens to take you through a case scenario so you can get a feel of what the Akumi solution can do for insider, outsider, cyber attacks. And then we can field questions at the end, but feel free to ask questions as you go. You can um, ask them just on, if you have questions during, just please unmute yourself so we can hear you, but um, when you're not asking questions, if you can mute yourself just to minimize noise. Take it away, Brian. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Angie. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the folks that have joined us here. Uh, I think this is going to be an interesting series, and I'm excited to be a part of it. And I appreciate everyone joining. So uh, what I'd like to do during the next hour is just uh, give a, a general introduction to uh, AI for cyber intelligence, give you an idea of, of how we apply it here at DataSkill, and uh, 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 sort of paint the picture of the threat and the threatscape generally, and then also how we can approach that threat and how we can solve the, the problems that we face today of the ever-emerging threatscape. So we'll talk about what is AI in a cyber world perspective. We'll, we'll talk about increasing our understanding of the threatscape and how it's changing. And then we'll talk about, we'll even look at a, a, a specific scenario and how Akumi can be used to to battle a specific threat. So with that, and, and uh, as I go through this, if you will, please uh, feel free to, to chime in uh, I'll, I'll, as I wrap up each, uh, each chapter. Uh, if, you, if you have questions, you can either uh, chime in and, and uh, ask them or post them in the message board. And uh, Angie will help me manage those. Also, Luke will be uh, speaking at different times and, and helping me out covering some of the content. So. We'll jump into it, and I'll tell you, I'm pretty excited about what we've got here. So uh, just to start off with, I want to talk about what is this threatscape. And uh, I, I'm sort of painting a, a goofy picture here of, of a, a comic book of, of threats. But it really is sort of like that. The, the kinds of threats that we face are changing almost at a Hollywood pace. We see uh, the bad guys, the, 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 the days of the bad guys breaking in the, the back door and stealing our inventory are really fading away. And now the threats are becoming much more virtual, but the impacts, I assure you, are every bit as real as somebody uh, picking up something off of your shelf and walking out with it. So we're going to look at things like uh, insider threats where you're dealing with employee or contractor or partner data and product theft. We're going to look at... Uh, Things like intellectual property, uh, where we're dealing with uh, patents and license theft, uh, corporate and client data theft, and even uh, from a government perspective, where you're looking at weapon systems, uh, diagrams, and drawings being stolen. So we've, we've seen all of those things. We'll look from a counterfeit perspective, where we're dealing with piracy and soft lifting and unbundling and furbishing. Some of those terms may be new. Uh, we'll, we'll We'll cover those as we as we need to uh, in the course of this series. And then we'll talk about fraud, uh, where we're dealing with warranty, uh, phishing, and gray market theft. 
Uh, and then uh, it, from a general cyber perspective, we'll talk about malware and data theft, uh, client and employee exposure, uh, vulnerability, uh, and uh, even cyber warfare. Uh, and uh, in, in that realm, we'll talk about things uh, like uh, cyber uh, advanced persistent threats. So what I, the point I want to make here is that we know the villains are out there. They're getting better at what they do. They outnumber us by far. And the problem with that is we can't just staff up enough cyber analysts and cybersecurity experts to deal with the threat at the pace that they're coming at us. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we know that the threat scape is massive and it's ever emerging and ever evolving. Uh, and there's no level, level of static defense that's going to protect our organizations. So the, the old days of firewalls and malware security and antivirus, that, that will help your laptop just fine, but it won't help your organization very well. So we'll, we'll look at all of those uh, from, a, from a general perspective. So let me stop there for a minute and ask uh, any questions about how we'll approach this or any, any insights from the group? All right, great. Hey, I, I like that. I, I like hearing myself talk sometimes. So something we know about the threats are that there are really only two kinds of companies out there. Those who have been compromised and those who don't know they have been compromised. And this is critical because everybody thinks, you know, I've got my security, I've got my, my team ready, I've got my, my security event and information management system up and running, and it's good. I'm, I'm protected. But when I use the term compromise, I'm referring to things like uh, being hacked or attacked or exposed or infiltrated or weakened. And, and all of those are up, and others are points within the threat vector. The threat vector is the complex matrix of areas where I am vulnerable or weak or could be harmed. And we'll talk about those in just a moment, about the types of harm that, that we'll, we can experience. So right now we know that on average, an organization is attacked about 1,400 times per week. That's the average organization. For big organizations, the number can be astronomically higher. For little tiny organizations or even your home network, the number is obviously smaller. But that's not in a year. That's 1,400 times per week. That's a scary number. And here's that more scary part. How many of those are successful and to what extent they're successful isn't known on average for eight months. So you get attacked 1,400 times a week. Eight months later, you find out what those attacks were if there was an impact. The only time that that, that changes is where the actors, the bad guys, the villains, decide to use that to their advantage faster. And sometimes they don't. And from a cyber perspective, just, just looking at the bigger picture here, uh, we're finding that the, the villains are very patient, they're very capable, and they're uh, very strategic. So they will, for example, extract client data from a company or an organization and hold on to that until it's useful to them in a specific way and then utilize it. And that could be a year later or more. But by then, it's really too late to do it. I believe somebody just joined and I need to mute their line. There we go. Bryant? Yep. Bryant? Yes. Where you're breaking up. Can you hear me now? Yes. Right. I just had to mute somebody's line. You had to mute somebody. Had joined. Thank you, Dave. All right. So uh, putting that... Uh, Putting that the scale of the threats of those who have been compromised and those who don't know they have been compromised on a timeline it becomes important because from an executive or a, an organizational management perspective, imagine putting that on your dashboard, uh, the, the real-time dashboard that shows the risks that your organization faces. And, and just move it over to the far right where you don't see the yellow or the red light pop up for eight months and after the incident has occurred, that becomes um, intolerable for virtually any organization. 
I, I can't imagine any any CEO or any uh, uh, military officer or security organization being okay with not knowing about the threat for that long. But the truth is that we deal with that on a daily basis. So what are those different organizations and how are they attacked? Well, so from a commercial perspective, we know that the threats are, are posed by people with the capability to elicit access or to inject uh, malware or other information into a system and then derive monetary gain or, this one's kind of weird, uh, they get satisfaction out of the havoc that they wreak to, to an organization. So we, and, and I won't call out specific company names just yet, but there are, there are quite a few. In fact, the number of organizations being hacked and exposed on a daily basis is astronomical. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at some of the commercial threats from a cyber, cybersecurity perspective. Uh, in this uh, series, we'll talk about the national defense and security threats, where foreign governments target other countries' systems and extract their information either to gain a tactical advantage or to cause embarrassment. And we've seen that happen a number of times in just the last year where uh, governments have attacked, na nation state governments have attacked one another or have exposed one another, or even some private organizations are attacking governments. And uh, that's actually made the media and even made a difference in the recent election here in the United States. So we, we do see a number of actors in the national defense and security space. And then also uh, in this series, we'll talk about the, the financial impacts of cybersecurity and, and the organizations that are affected there. So we see things like uh, extending from fraud of government to commercial to money laundering to, uh, to fund uh, criminal activities and to even to fund terrorist activities. I know in my work at one of the largest banks in the U.S., I, I, won't, I won't name them here, uh, we were dealing with a number of threats where... Uh, we, we refer to it generally as anti-money laundering, but it, it entailed a number of threats, both cyber and non-cyber, where they were literally using the accounts or the access to accounts to fund money or cleanse money or prepare money to go to uh, terrorist organizations. So that's a, a big threat. So I will name one, one or two companies here, and, and uh, one that we've all just recently heard about where Yahoo was hacked, and this one was actually the largest cyber attack in history. Uh, so we know that 450,000 passwords were just posted online uh, the other day. That's massive. I don't know about you, but uh, how many times are, are your passwords exposed? Not just your passwords. It gets worse than that. So uh, I, I know for me, and I'll mention another organization, I, I hold a, a U.S. government clearance. That means I have access to, as a, as a need to know, different, different systems. To obtain that clearance, I had to go through a lengthy process, and I had to provide the U.S. government with tons of information about me. I had to provide them everything about everyone I've ever lived, uh, everybody I've known, uh, everything I've done, all the work I do, my financial uh, accounts, everything. They, they had access to everything on me. But, hey, it was the government. I trust them, right? except that uh, about a year ago, maybe it was two years ago, the Office of Personnel Management contacted me, and probably many of you as well, and notified me that their systems had been hacked and my data had been compromised. And that data, by the way, is so sensitive, I don't know that I could myself replicate it without hours and hours and hours of work. But somewhere out there on the web, is all of my information, yeah, go, go searching for me, you'll find it, <laughs> I hope not. Uh, somewhere out there, probably on the, the deep web, is all of that OPM data, Office of Personnel Management data, on many of those of us here on, on this line and millions of other people out there. And it's just a matter of time when someone chooses to utilize that information to attack us in some way or another. So we know the threat's real, and it's just a matter of, de of determining how we want to deal with it. So let's, let's look at, uh, from a, a broad perspective, threat management versus risk acceptance. And let me stop before I move on. I, I should have stopped and asked. Any, any questions? We've had a few people join uh, uh, in, in the course of the last few minutes. Any questions so far on, on anything I've covered or, or areas where you want to dive deeper? 
Right, great. So you know, let's, let's talk about uh, threat management versus risk acceptance. So we know that most companies acknowledge that theft and, cy and cybercrime are the greatest threat to their organization, whether it's their reputation or their revenue or the security of their people and their clients. But less than half of the organizations out there that were, that were surveyed are confident in their security programs. What that means is they are literally opting to stick their head in the sand. They're saying, we'll accept the threat and we'll deal with it when it happens, or rather when, we, when it's too big for us to ignore, because it's going to happen on a daily basis anyway. This means that most organizations are just dealing with the consequences rather than the threat itself. Uh, and and this, this is where we get into the difference between uh, you know, risk management and uh, issue management. Once, once the bad guys have your data or have access to your systems, there's really not much you can do to get it back. It becomes exponentially more costly and more complex to protect your information once it's been uh, exposed. We know that hospitals and banks and other industries all have custom systems, and this is where it gets really hard, that are unique to them and more complex to protect than general off-the-shelf systems. Uh, and these are frequently targeted by cyber villains. And the most common security approach that organizations use for this is perimeter security. I'm going to refer to perimeter security as a form of risk acceptance because what you're saying is we're going to keep this wall up and anybody inside the wall can do anything they want, but anybody outside the wall we're safe from. That works great for 95% of the bad guys out there. And what that means is the other 5% of the bad guys are the most dangerous the most capable bad guys out there, and they will do the worst damage to your organization. So we need to be vigilant, we need to be dynamic, we need to be creative. Uh, as, we need to be more so than the cyber villains. But here's the problem. There are way more of them than there are of us. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, hackers and organizations that are set up specifically for the purpose of uh, hacking into your your organizations and your data than there are you or me. So we have to uh, employ systems that give us the ability to act faster, more actively, and to actually deal with the threat rather than just accepting it. So we're, we're going to look at uh, how, to, how threat management works from an artificial intelligence perspective. And it really is a matter of when you're going to get hit and not if you're going to get hit. Uh, so, uh, Luke and Angie, feel free to uh, chime in if I'm if I'm skipping over anything here. Okay. That's, uh, that's great, Brian. Keep going. All right. Hey, I like that. So, <laughs> I want to look at, now that we know the threat, now that we know that it really is virtually incomprehensible, it's it's too big to fight, it's, uh, it's having a drastic impact on our organizations every day, uh, and it's costing globally about $400 billion a year to the global economy. Uh, what, what could we possibly do about it? What are the superpowers that we could employ to give us the ability to manage the threat? And this is where it gets really interesting. Uh, I want to back up for a minute. The, the title of this presentation is Artificial Intelligence. Uh, I want to talk about what is artificial intelligence. So we know that uh, AI is defined as the systems that are capable of performing tasks that people usually do, that require human intelligence, like visual perception, and speech recognition, and decision making, and intelligent decision making is critical, by the way, not just math, not logical solutions, uh, and translation between languages. So AI being this complex set of abilities that we give computers, it's not Believe it or not, it's not the iRobot of the robots walking around. It's really the systems that process and think the way people do. And then when we combine some of, some of those things uh, that we refer to as AI with some of the other AI capabilities like machine learning and nat natural language processing, uh, we, we, get, we move to a point where we literally have systems that think like we do, learn like we do, and act like we do. And that's where it becomes important. Uh, 
uh, when, when a system that only does alerting or blocking and never, never uh, learns from the processes or the experience it has, uh, when, when that's all you have, you really don't have uh, the ability to manage the threat that you're going to be facing uh, in, in the emerging threatscape. So uh, artificial intelligence takes us quite a, quite a few steps further and gives us the ability to, to see the threat, to understand the threat, and then to learn from the threat as we go far, go forward. Uh, so if we, if we think about it from this perspective, what we're going to find is that the bad guys that are accessing systems or attempting to access systems that are uh, developing new tools and utilizing those tools across organizations, whether they're uh, in the open web or the deep or dark web, everything they do is generating data. And we're going to use that data within our AI systems to identify them, what they're doing, and how they're doing it. And all of that data becomes valuable to us. So even within our organization, whatever the organization is, we're going to see that we have access to almost an immeasurable amount of intelligence that we just usually don't know how to get to. We see things like our security event and information management systems uh, like Splunk or QRadar or so many others that are out there that capture logs of everything happening on the perimeter of our network and inside our network and within our applications and our data stores. Those are really valuable, but truthfully, they only give us one or two dimensions of intelligence. And, and they only give us a, a static ability to manage the threat. Alerts and blocks are not effective. We, we need to be able to respond intelligently to each threat. So some of those uh, are just some of the sources. And then we're going to find also in this series that our, our, our intelligence is not just in the actor's data, but also in our data and in open source data and in other areas where we're going to get into. So we're going to see that everything we have access to and everything that the bad guys have access to is going to be used to give us the ability to act. And now I've got here a couple of bullets I want to talk about specifically. So this first one looks like uh, we're speaking a foreign language. Entities, links, and properties. Uh, so uh, we refer to this as ELP. In the AI space, what we're going to do is we're going to look at every actor, every bad guy, good guy, every event, every location, everything, every noun, or pronoun or proper noun as an entity. So we have specific bad guys, we have good guys, we have unrelated guys. Uh, we have, whether we're dealing with a, a cell phone or a record or a vehicle or a location, all of those are entities that we're gonna, we're gonna analyze. And the reason we look at entities and we use that term is because entities is a, a single category that our AI systems can understand. So we, we tell it everything that might fit into this, this definition, and then it learns as we, as we advance it what those entities are and begins recognizing not just that this is Bryant, a person, but who is Bryant. And, that, and now who is Bryant gets me into the links, and this is really interesting. Uh, Bryant is related to uh, his brother and his sister and his parents. Uh, Bryant uh, has uh, property that he owns. Bryant has uh, uh, a vehicle he owns. So all these links are links between Bryant and other entities. So that gives us depth into understanding the entities. That's really valuable and, and a different level from just trying to chart that on a spreadsheet. By the way, uh, you'll, you'll see, especially when we get into some of our, our charting here in a little bit and through this series, you'll see that uh, uh, putting a spreadsheet together of entities and links and properties is virtually useless. Uh, there's just too much data and too much repetition to see any value in it. That's where we're going to get into visual analysis. But I haven't talked yet about properties. So... Entities are all of the things we're, we're dealing with, the people, places, events, and other things. Links are what connects those different entities. And the properties are details about both the entities and the links. So if Bryant owns a house, 
the properties might be when Bryant purchased that house and what is the address of that house and what are the taxes on the house and who visits that house. Now we're dealing with tying more links and entities into it. So all of those things build intelligence into our system. So we begin to see a level of detail that we, we couldn't have seen before. And by the way, this is something, this is really interesting. Uh, you can put an investigator or a team of investigators on a complex data set and have them running whatever kinds of queries you want, whatever kinds of uh, analytics you want, and you're still only going to get a limited set of results. When you start multiplying the strengths uh, of, the, of the people involved through artificial intelligence, you get a lot more capability. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll look at um, uh, the entities, links, and properties of analysis. And then we'll talk about analytics versus an analysis. So analytics are the tools, and, and this is a really important distinction. Now, analytics are the tools we use to understand our threat scape and to understand our data. Analysis is a human function, always. So uh, an analyst uses analytics to understand the threat or to understand the opportunity. And we'll, we'll look at the, the depth of how those two apply, and we'll even talk here in just a minute about some of the specifics around those. And then I, I mentioned before uh, spreadsheets and, and analytics and tools that give us a, an idea of the threat, or that uh, I mentioned also Splunk and QRadar as SIMs that give us some detail around all of the things that are happening, but lack the insight into shining the light on the actual threat. Which, which ones do we need to be looking at? This is where visual analysis comes in. So visual analysis gives us the ability to see the data as not just data. It gives us the ability to see the data as a specific threat or a specific outlier. And outlier is an important term here because with most visual analysis and with most statistical reviews, uh, we're, we're looking at the trends of data. And trends can be, can be pretty helpful to see, but they lack the key point of the outliers. With uh, visual analysis, we're looking not for the trends, not for the bell curve, but for the ones that stand out as unusual. A, a specific individual that's logging in at odd hours or accessing a, a system at, uh, in, in an unusual rate uh, we're looking for things like that that stand out as, as the oddities within the system. And you'll see, we'll, we'll talk about Akumi, and we'll, we'll be showing you Akumi here in a few minutes, a, a little bit. We'll talk about Akumi as the intelligent solution that uh, multiplies the power and the capability of the analyst uh, or the operator. And by the way, I, I want to emphasize something here. Uh, Akumi is not just an IT tool. In fact, it's designed specifically around the analyst so that the guy who's looking for the bad guy doesn't have to be an expert in databases or in data science or in engineering. He can be an expert in his specific field, whether that's uh, management of his warehouse or management of his um, uh, people or management of his finances and, and have access to the system uh, to Akumi and identify specific threats that only that person within their level of expertise would be able to identify. The IT guys are great and they will use this tool quite a bit from an IT perspective and that's their forte. But we'll also see that Akumi works in a number of other areas. I've added here um, a couple of mentions for Watson and EIA. These are two of the, we'll call them the engine and the transmission of Akumi. Uh, these are IBM products, and uh, we know Watson is, is the, the popular product that we've seen uh, on Jeopardy and in other places and in the media quite a bit. Watson is an intelligence solution, or, or rather an intelligence platform, that uh, allows understanding, an artificial understanding of data and information, and then provides intelligence insight on that information. 
Secondly, uh, EIA, or Enterprise Insight Analysis, is another IBM product that we use on the, on the back end of Akumi that gives us the ability to extract the entities, links, and properties, and then conduct the visual analysis on those ELPs so that we can better understand the specific threat and uh, track down the, the threat in the process of our investigation. So let me, let me stop here for a minute and ask, uh, are, there, are there any questions about uh, what we've defined here as AI within this space and the, the tools that we're talking about from an AI perspective for uh, uh, intelligence? Hey, Brian, not exactly a question, but uh, I really liked what you said about accessibility to real people doing analysis. And when I think of AI, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, mysticism or, um, you know, flair around that term. And I think, you know, I think this is exciting because, and what Akumi does is it it, bring, it makes AI practical and uh, it finds good applications for them. And one, one comment that I just thought of if I was seeing this presentation for the first time, which obviously I'm not, but um, I just thought of the fact that a lot of people may wonder, okay, so artificial intelligence, you know, what does that really, really mean in, in this in this process of, uh, of discovering cyber threats and things like that? And, and, uh, and to me, what's exciting is, you know, artificial intelligence methods are a tool, and we have a, we have a problem to solve, and we don't solve every problem with a single tool. So we will we'll use AI methods to do things like scan documents and, and find themes and filter down um, things that can come out for reasons that we don't know, but we know that, that what people are saying in those documents is linked to the outcome, and we let the, the machine do the rest. And it's, it, it finds incredible connections that, uh, that even with your own human analysis, you wouldn't always be able to see the connections, but the computer has enough processing power to find that. Um, and so uh, that's one of the things that I'm excited about with Akumi, is that um, it's using several tools to solve a bigger problem in a pretty elegant uh, combination. Spot on. Thanks, Luke. I appreciate that insight. And, you know, I, I see uh, just looking at the at the list of folks on, uh, we have a, a number of people that are very capable, uh, and I, I recognize some of these names, and I appreciate you guys joining. Uh, I, I, I even see some, we've got a visitor from outside the uh, the Milky Way. We've got Obi-Wan Kenobi on. I'm not sure who that is, but thanks for joining. <laughs> that, that, that's... Appreciate that, Andrew Tuck. But, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we, we've got we've got visitors from from everywhere, so so thanks for joining. So let me let me take this uh, a little bit further and and talk about uh, some of some of the places we'll go in this uh, series and and even in this specific uh, session today. So we've talked about some of the capabilities of Akumi, uh, and uh, and the the neat thing here is that it really is very broad. So when we look at some of the superpowers it gives us. Let me just describe some of these and and talk about how it fits on on your uh, investigative or analytic tool belt uh, and and what they do for you. So some of the things that we can do uh, with uh, Akumi beyond just analyzing data, because analyzing data just doesn't sound that sexy. It doesn't. But uh, we we know that we can do things like sentiment analysis. We can understand in the process of our investigation what people were thinking or how they were feeling either individually or as a group. And that's where it gets really interesting when you start seeing the outliers. For example, uh, we were recently meeting with a group uh, with a, uh, I'll just call them a government agency that was looking at uh, trying to identify people who are radicalizing through social media. And, and that's something that we can do, not just sentiment analysis, but also social media analysis. So with social media analysis, that's extracting not just all of the metadata around uh, who's connected to who and what are they doing online, but also how are they feeling and what are they saying. And when we get into that, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute, we get into the, the content of their message, uh, which is the other 80%. So we'll also talk about some of the uh, powers. One of the powers that we have is getting into analysis of peer-to-peer -peer networks. And we know that, for example, in the entertainment industry, there's a massive loss in revenue related to theft of intellectual property where uh, movies, music, and others are being stolen and then shared through peer-to-peer -peer networks. And 
for the most part, those those movies and, mu and songs are being replicated across tons of networks, both on the web and on the deep web. And we're seeing that when someone makes a copy of it and shares it with somebody else, obviously they're not going to make any changes to that file. We have the ability, one of our superpowers is the ability to analyze that specific file and then track it across the web and track it uh, as it as it traverses different networks and identify where its uh, source original source was and that provenance becomes very relevant to not protecting this one song but the next one or the next one uh, so then we get into also other types of superpowers we have are uh, geospatial and temporal analysis where we can look at the data as it fits across a literal map of a space, whether we're looking at uh, a, a building or a city or the globe, we can understand ties between different people. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak just for a second about this. For example, if we see that a bad guy or a, a known entity is traveling and, and visiting a specific town or city somewhere globally at the same time, same frequency as, an, as a, another known or even an unknown entity, and we start to seek connections between those, the the links, not the properties, but the links of, of those different entities meeting at the same location becomes really relevant. And visually, until you can see that on a map, it's just not as helpful. It's not as insightful. So the geospatial analysis becomes very helpful. Temporal analysis is helpful where we're looking at things across not just space, but also across time. Uh, and we can we can graph and chart the anomalies on our on our data across time to see uh, heat maps or specific surges in activity or uh, other other elements of the time and space uh, function and then also we'll we'll look at uh, things like IT I'm sorry IP uh, internet protocol address uh, of entities where we can track a person to a phone to a computer uh, to a phone line which by the way a phone and a phone line are not always the same thing even if it's uh, a cell phone nowadays uh, and then we'll, we'll look at the different types of powers we can get out of that we'll also look at some of the tools that Akumi gives us where we have the ability to flexibly adjust the data we're pulling in and and how we analyze that data so we, we refer to it as a flexible annotator and annotation is literally the extraction of those entities and links and properties from data. And this is where I need to stop for a second and talk about uh, structured data versus unstructured data. So all of your logs, your reports, spreadsheets, um, all of your files that, that fit into a database or a, a, a spreadsheet are typically structured data. We know of a, a few exceptions, and I'll talk about those. But we, we, whenever something fits into a row or a column, it's, it's structured. And what that means is we, we might have a column named uh, first name and one named last name. So we can easily extract and identify the people from that structured data, and not just the people, but also other uh, uh, events and properties from, uh, from the data. And then also all the metadata around that that's built within the structured data tells us more about the links and the properties of the entities. Uh, so we get a good picture of ELP from structured data. But we know that right now about 80% of our data and our intelligence is not structured. It's in the unstructured. So what that means is if you're analyzing all of your structured data, you're still missing 80% of the picture, which is pretty scary. <laughs> Especially if you know that there's 1,400 attacks per week and you're only looking at 20% uh, of them. So uh, the unstructured data is everything that's embedded within the message. So I might send an email to Luke. I'm, I'm an entity, Luke's an entity, the email is an entity, but the content of that message is unstructured. It's just me typing a sentence or a paragraph or sending a picture, whatever it is, and that unstructured content is where we, we typically miss the mark and requires usually a human to go through and analyze, read through each email and see what's there. Well, we have the ability through Akumi to extract those intelligently. So if, if in that email 
I said, hey, Luke, I'll meet you at the bar Friday at 6. Well, the system will recognize, Akumi will recognize that Bryant will be meeting Luke, two entities, at the bar, and that's another entity, Friday at 6 p.m. That's an event, so that's an entity. And then, and then it starts putting the, the different things together and, uh, and starts identifying the, the specifics around those. So uh, all of this data that's hidden within our unstructured data becomes uh, really important to understand. Uh, so, uh, and I'll, I'll put this in context a little bit, and you're looking here on the screen at, at a picture of Akumi, just a snapshot of, of how we use it. But uh, I'll mention that some of the work we do around uh, major telcos, where we're determining the, the intent of an actor in real time, and then providing an agent with the intelligence to act in real time. That's the kind of capabilities that Akumi can do for us uh, and, and give us uh, uh, a heads up advantage over uh, the enemy. Uh, any uh, questions or insights at this point before I move on? All right, great. Uh, so uh, next, I just want to mention uh, the uh, <laughs> the powers that we have. Akumi, the really neat thing about it, I mentioned before that, and, and Luke mentioned this as well, that it enables the individual working in their space who has their unique expertise to have these tools and powers. So it literally makes you the expert, it makes you the superhero, which is pretty neat. Uh, and then lets you uh, identify the bad guys uh, for escalation. And, and this is really important. Once you identify the bad guy, what do you do with it? Well, uh, you can take a number of actions. You can immediately stop them from acting. You can escalate to whether it be corporate security or law enforcement or an operational team that goes out and gets the bad guy, uh, or uh, call in fire for effect on that location. Whatever it is that you need to do based on your specific role. Most uh, corporate entities aren't going to send a, a, round, a round down range, but uh, some, of, some of the uh, clients that we work with would do that. So we're going to look uh, here at a, a real life uh, scenario. Uh, in this case, we, we refer to this as we've changed the names to protect the guilty. Uh, in case they appeal. <laughs> uh, we're going to look at a scenario where uh, we, we have a case that this is a, a few known bad guys. We, we knew who they were. We had an idea of what they were doing in an organized crime ring, but everything we had was small fish. We, we didn't have the big guys. And then one day we got lucky, and we uh, an officer pulled over one of the bigger fish uh, for a DWI. He, in the process of arresting him, ran Cellbrite on uh, this guy's this guy whose name is Apollo that uh, ran Cellbrite on his iPhone. Cellbrite is an appliance that law enforcement ha can carry that allows them to plug into your cell phone and extract all the data from it quite rapidly whether you have it locked or not. Uh, so we're, we're going to look at in this scenario we we extract a bunch of data from his phone. Among that data is his uh, Gmail account and his password and then that gives us a combination and this is really important of both the structured data, who he's calling, who he's receiving calls and texts from, um, and who his contacts are, all of that structured data. And then the unstructured is the content of his emails and the content of his text messages. That gives us an invaluable level of intelligence that no individual or team could have done as fast as Akumi will do it. So we'll, we'll ingest uh, all kinds of content, whether it be documents or web addresses, URLs, uh, or audio and video uh, in, in the near future. We'll be able to do audio and video and images and OCR and more uh, within Akumi. Uh, and then uh, we'll look at uh, how that works from uh, capturing that intelligence and, and, make, and structuring that intelligence so that we can do more with it. Uh, what we identified in this scenario, you'll see, is uh, we were able to identify a bad guy who was very careful to conceal their identity and made one little slip up and the intelligence we built into Akumi was able to identify that without knowing specifically to look for that. So we'll, we'll see that and then we'll, we'll walk through the scenario and, and just sort of uh, describe what's happening as we get there. So uh, here I'm going to go ahead and start this demo and, and what you're going to see here in the beginning is uh, this is uh, uh, IBM Watson is one of the engines to Akumi, 
Uh, and here we've ingested a couple of uh, collections of emails from uh, from someone named uh, Muhammad Ali, or I'm sorry, Mo Ali. Sorry, it wasn't Muhammad. Uh, Mo Ali. Uh, <laughs> we did we did change names, right? Uh, and Muhammad had nothing to do with this. Uh, so we're, we're we're going to extract all the content of these emails, and that's both the structured and the unstructured. We're going to pull that into uh, our our dictionaries of persons, locations, and uh, events, and then we're going to analyze it within uh, within uh, Akumi. So here, what we're doing is we've set up a collection of uh, of intelligence sources that we've pulled in, and then we what, what we can do with this is, like I say, we're identifying the entities and the uh, links and the properties, and then we have the ability to capture the source provenance, which is the details around all of the all of the intelligence we gathered every every source we got it from every file we got it from uh, and uh, every uh, who extracted it whoever it was whatever it was about that data and then we have the ability to understand from that um, uh, all of the specific identities that were captured and then uh, and I'm just going to pause this here for just a second uh, we we have the ability to once we've extracted all of that uh, pulled out whatever value there might be in it. You have the ability to do some some really neat analysis on it. Uh, and uh, when with the first run, we might we might extract all of the names, and this is where the artificial intelligence comes in, uh, and uh, and gives us some additional insight. So in a, in a sentence or in a paragraph rather, I might say Bryant is leading a, a workshop. He is taking too long, <laughs> uh, interrupting my lunch. Well, uh, the the interesting part there is the Bryant is leading a, a workshop is a very clear set of entities and links that we can pull from that sentence. The second sentence, he is interrupting my lunch, is vague in most terms, but with something called an anaphor annotator, we can identify that he is referring to Bryant. So now Bryant's interrupting your lunch, which is really rude, by the way. Um, so we'll be able to pull out all of the different anaphors, and then also something else, a cataphor, uh, which is the inverse of an anaphor. Every kind of linguistic function that you can think of, we can, we can either utilize or develop the right artificial intelligence around it to pull in the information that would give us the insight we need around that. So here, uh, where this becomes applicable to this so this scenario, is when we're extracting um, uh, the content of unstructured data, uh, we're we're going to be able to vary the the ingestion. So we have this flexible annotator, and with a strict ingestion, what that does is it gives us an insight into I'm only looking for names. And I want, I want proper names, proper nouns. Uh, and that will pull all those in and allow us to visually analyze them. I might want something different, though. I might want to be a little bit more flexible. I want to see uh, all of the names and the similar uses of names. So, for example, uh, dollar might be a name. But if I want to find anywhere somebody mentions a buck or a dinero or whatever else, whatever other kind of uh, synonym, I can make it a little bit more flexible, and then I can go all the way as far as a sound X, where I'm looking for anything that sounds like Bryant. So in this case, it would be all variables of Bryant. Uh, if I if I put it on the most lenient setting, all variables of, of Bryant and everything that sounds like Bryant and everything that might be like Bryant. So uh, this gives me the ability through this this intelligence uh, tool to pull out the right level of information without having to re-ingest or reanalyze it each time. Uh, and then we also have the ability to do things like uh, a, a, a specific search term by entity type. So if I'm only looking for people, I can, I can enter the people that I'm looking for, and uh, Akumi will actually pop up. Uh, you can see on, on here the, the screen checkbox will pop up and show me, hey, that, name, that term that you've entered is, is in this source, so it's good. Go ahead and search for it. But I can choose to look only for whatever kind of dictionary term I'm looking for, whether entities, I'm sorry, whether people, events, locations, vehicles, phones, whatever it is I'm looking for. 
I can specify that here. And then also I can look at, uh, uh, I, I'm looking for where Bryant is in uh, proximity to the term uh, webinar. And, uh, and uh, I, I can do a, a proximity search or what we refer to as a near term search. We use near terms instead of proximity because within Akuma you can also do geospatial analysis and we don't want to confuse the two. Uh, and then we can also do uh, pretty much anything you can do in Watson through our advanced search. Any kind of query you want to enter and you don't have to be a Watson expert either here for this. Uh, you can uh, click on uh, on this question mark here. It will pop up uh, a number of templates for the types of queries you might be looking for. You can populate the search box with that template and replace everything in the brackets with the specific uh, an answers you're looking for and then run that search. And each time you do a different type of search or a different search, it's going to provide that highlighted content in a different color here and, and allow you to see that. So uh, this, this is a pretty neat ability to analyze the data uh, before you even get into the visual charting, just looking at the, um, uh, at the extraction of that data. So uh, I'm just going to fast forward here a little bit and look at uh, what it looks like when we chart that data. So here, and I'm going to pause it again, uh, this is the extraction of a ton of data from that email collection. And we refer to this as the Death Star. It's typically not good to have a Death Star. Uh, and the reason I'll say that is because what we see here is it's hard to visualize the links between all of these things. And you can see, if I were to zoom in here, you'd see that there's uh, lots of people, there's lots of locations, there's lots of dollar amounts, there's lots of events in here. Uh, and they're not very specific. They're just all linked to this one email collection. We, we did this, in this case, as an extraction against one collection, but we could separate it and do the analysis against each email separately, and which runs almost just as fast, and we're still talking milliseconds of difference, uh, and, and produce a chart that looks very different. But in this case, we're trying to pull out the links from different sources, and we're going to see that in a minute. So uh, here what we've seen is there's a lot of, entities here with, with links, all of them back to the central source, but Akumi recognized some unique links between some of this data and, uh, and called that out. And, and this, by the way, is, is quite autonomous in terms of how it functions. So uh, here we're able to, uh, as, we, as we analyze our data, choose, I want to look at the data different. I want to specifically search for this term, or I want to see a link between two pseudonyms or uh, I want to edit my dictionary so I can find different things. And this is really helpful when we're dealing with uh, gangs or uh, uh, terrorist organizations that are really good at, uh, or even uh, hacking groups, they're really good at uh, being cryptic about how they function. They even use their own languages. We've seen uh, within a, a prison organization, uh, an organized crime within prisons, where they had some of the most complex uh, masking tools for, for their communications uh, that we'd ever seen. So. Uh, we're able to edit our dictionaries and get into understanding exactly what's happening with them uh, as on the fly. And this is really helpful because most visual analysis tools require you bring in your, your IT guys or some third party every three or six months or a year and update your dictionaries with the intelligence you've gained over the last year. That's costly and it's extremely time delayed. So if you're literally waiting a, only once a year or only even once a quarter getting an update to your intelligence system, uh, you're, you're adding time to that eight week delay between the event and discovery. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to look at uh, instead how with Akumi you have the ability to dynamically edit your dictionaries and pull in information. Now here in this case, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause this for a second. Uh, something that's really interesting that Akumi did here for us that we, we couldn't have planned it quite this way, but it, it found this. So by identifying the links and the properties of different entities, Akumi, you can see here, pulled up uh, someone named Adrian and someone named Adrian Panini and someone named Talia Shore. Really interesting because this person, we never knew anything about this person. We didn't know this person existed. 
But we knew that Adrian Panini was uh, involved in this crime organization, but we didn't know what, what she was doing. We didn't know her role. So uh, what we were able to do is, uh, as, we, as uh, Akumi provided the, the insight, it showed us that one time out of thousands of emails, Adrian signed off at the end of her email as Talia Shore and used the same email address here. It's, it's just visually showing you that. That tells you, hey, there's something really odd here. What, what does that mean that, that, uh, that this other person is using this same email address and the same writing personality and everything? Uh, so what that tells us is that's probably a, a pseudonym or a, a, a fake name for Adrian. So we were able to identify that and then take that from there and, uh, and combine it with some structured data. And I'll just, I'll just forward through here a little bit um, and, and talk about what that means. So we were able to, uh, I'm sorry, before I get into the, the structured, uh, the, un, the unstructured data also showed us here that there were specific locations mentioned within the content of the emails, and then specific groups. So the, the stock boys were referred to and mechs were referred to. We, we discovered through Akumi, and then once it highlighted it, we were able to go in and, and, and analyze that, the details. See, the stock boys were the guys that were stealing uh, 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 narcotics, uh, prescription narcotics, and then the mechs were the guys preparing it for black market. So uh, that, that was really helpful insight to understanding uh, uh, more detail around the threat from an unstructured perspective. And then, and then I'll pull it over here and just uh, show you where we can see some of the structured data. Now this right here is uh, the ex extract of Apollo's Cellbrite data. This shows us uh, individual calls that he made, and then uh, these, each one of these lines is an individual call made to a different line where uh, he made multiple calls, uh, either, and in this case, we, we chose not to chart it as showing the direction of the call, whether it was incoming or outgoing, but you can read it on the, on the line, incoming or outgoing, and that becomes helpful to understand who's calling who. Uh, and, then, and then when we get into uh, the, the details around of combining the unstructured and the structured, this, this is where it becomes really helpful. We've got this structured data from the cell phone. We've got this structured data from a list of known associates, uh, someone named Evander, and someone, uh, uh, another database of known associates with someone named Mikey. And then uh, this is the email extract over here. And then we, what we see is that there's a common link to this Adrian Panini. And, uh, and now we know that Akumi has identified Adrian as Talia Shore. Uh, and we actually know now that uh, this Talia is the leader of this group and, and is the center point of the distribution sites, the individuals operating the group, and then the, uh, the gangs or groups that are in distribution. So that gave us a lot of insight. Now this is just a really high level, uh, quick run through of Akumi um, and only shows us a couple of aspects of it. There's a ton more we can get into. Uh, I, I don't want to do, do too much of that today. But in the following series, we'll get into the more detail. So I realize now I've, I've not left much time for questions, but let me stop here and, uh, and hand it over to Angie and see uh, if we have any questions that have come in or if anybody else has questions for us. Feel free to ask any questions now or uh, email our questions, uh, any questions that you might have to us if they're in a sensitive nature or you wish to know more about the ACB product. But, um, Today, obviously, in the short time we had, the product is very, very deep and very wide in terms of all the various different cognitive tools that it utilizes and all the sources of information. But anything that we can do to help you to learn about the product and how it might fit your particular business, please let us know. And uh, any questions that you have, you can ask them now or separately email them to us. Great, great. And Thank I'm happy you for your time. Soon. Thanks. Why don't you give your... Uh, your email, Brian. Yep, that's a great idea. Uh, so uh, my email is bhaines at dataskill.com. Uh, it's on the screen now. Uh, any questions from anybody that, that would like to chime in? All right, great. We, we have run to the, the top of the hour. I really appreciate everybody's uh, participation and look forward to having you on for the next, uh, next in the series. Have a great day.
Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.